watch it through the, the crack. And, and it's, it's the sort of be old thing that everybody says, you know, I just used to watch it behind the sofa or like that. Big part to my childhood, so it's, uh, you know, one of those things, what, bat, bats a brush, being pat through Larry Grayson's generation game, sort of all go hand in hand, as, you know, I'm sure Saturday evenings did for a lot of people. It's, it's there, rooted somewhere in my net race. And when you don't have to tune the faded doctor. Oh, God. I was, asked, I was asked this the other day about a favourite doctor. Um, and it'd be really, I mean, you always get, when you, when you ask companions or whatever, have you got a favourite doctor? Um, they, they always give this answer where, oh, I mean, I, you know, I, I like them all, they were all different. So my answer to that would be, you know, the one I grew up with was, I think, Tom Baker. Um, so, you know, he's the one I remember most. Um, but, you know, yeah, and they're all good in their own different. That's a cop and answer, isn't it? I'm so scared, so it's, it's a terrible answer. In fact, I, Tom is the one who I certainly remember from my childhood, who is the one who sort of gave yeah, me my first introduction to Dr. Pooh. So, is the answer to that. It was very good on the, on the children's need. Um, we had a great deal of difficulty getting him. Uh, because he was extremely busy uh, doing a series of medics and uh, lots of voiceovers. So I think it was the one day they had free was the Tuesday. Um, it was about the 20th, 21st of September. So he came to a studio in New Malden, found some television, and uh, just did this a minute along the scene. She's actually quite a quite a large chunk of children in each, so I think it's about 13 and a half, 14 minutes as it's worked out. We were, we were commissioned to write a seven minute and a five minute episode, but because there was so much material, they actually allowed us to go over length. So I think the first one runs at about 7.50. The other one is about six, so it's such a slight number. We ran, so it's, it's very good though, it's very good. We, he kept he kept sort of turning down uh, all the bits of script that I sent to him because I, I, I was told to, to write some it was very Tom so if you I mean uh, let's say if you know Tom but uh, in Tom's stories it was something to seem to ask questions twice I mean do you know who I am do you know who I am I mean it's, it's very interesting I'm the doctor I'm the doctor do you know I was the doctor and does all that sort of stuff so I wrote something like that and he'd be sent it back it's dreadful is this supposed to be a comedy or is it supposed to be serious? So I wrote another bit. It was about the fifth piece that I sent him, faxed him Monday, Monday afternoon. And he was due to film at 10 on the Tuesday morning. And he turned up in the studio on the Tuesday morning with uh, this piece of paper, this faxed piece of paper covered in red ink. And I thought, oh, I let it out a good It's going to be really difficult and he's not going to do this to you. And he just slashes here a bit scribbled out. And uh, he sat down and said, I have one question. Is it, uh, is it serious or is it comedy? I thought it's serious. He said, marvellous, I'll do it, I'll do it. Well, so he went off with him, they typed it into the autocue. And uh, he literally just went in and did four takes. Um, the first two takes were a long version, um, which ran at about 1 minute 50. And then the second two takes were a cut down version, which he cut down himself, which all, all the red scribbles were. Um, and thus we used the fourth take, uh, which, is, which was the, the shorter version, which is actually the, his, his best performance. Um, so it was all right. There was, was one bit suddenly in the center of it, in the, in the fourth take, where it's obvious that he's reading the autocue. So what we did was we slapped the model shot over that over that section, which actually luckily did fit because it's a model shot of the, the Rani's TARDIS in space. And was the two heads of Hart and Trout and spinning out of the Rani's TARDIS into a black hole. Um, and the lines of that stage were, were, were something like, uh, which and he'd, he'd written the line, the one line at that, that stage, which was something like, uh, this is an urgent message for all of the doctors, whoever you are. Um, do you remember the grumpy one of the artist, which was his mind? 
and thankfully we've managed to swap that that's for five second shot in which so when you watch it it's not obvious it is reading the auto actually I've been going down and you go on the road I'm sorry that's it this way so he's very good very good we got costume on him as well which was which was nice because he came into the studio with extremely short cropped with white hair practically shaved and uh, he said uh, do I look like Quentin Crisp and everybody's no no you don't no you don't, no, you don't. No, you don't. You don't. Oh, well, I, have you got a costume? Have you got a, have you got a scarf or something I can wear? Um, and what happened was he, he'd originally turned up saying, I'm not going to wear the costume. Refuse me. And I'll, I'll, I will wear my medic suit. <laughs> 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 so, so he said, well, fine. Fine, told no, no, no problem at all. And then he got into the studio and I said, do I have a venting, Chris? Have you got, have you got a scarf or something? Helping me up. So, so John, who secretly brought the costume, the stash of Duena cupboard, said, uh, well, I think we might have a scarf somewhere. We'll, we'll see what we've got. So Ken True can knock something up for you. He, he vanished off at left on having his makeup put on. And uh, came back and said, well, actually, we, we've got a scarf. Marvellous, wonderful, I'll pull that on. We've all, we also found, purely by coincidence, <laughs> your coat, your waistcoat, <laughs> your hat. Do you want to put that? Up? Yes, certainly. <laughs> so we had them all put on, all, all, all the costume on, and look fabulous. I mean, you've been in the Cinderella Times cover. I mean, it's sort of, how many years is it since you left? 13, 15 years? So, you know, it's sort of changed quite a lot, especially there. Um, you know, the hat covers up the, the white, short, cropped hair, but I mean, it looked fabulous. And he took, took the costume off at the end, and uh, so do you know what it takes me back? Those were the days. I, I think he quite enjoyed it. I was a bit of But he, he, he's actually got more of a contribution in the final thing than, than Peter Davidson. Or I see more of a contribution, more lines than later. Because Tom's got about 55 seconds worth of dialogue. Whereas well, Peter's got the clip now. Be clear for the next episode. Um, he's got very few lines, like when I say run, Run. Run! <laughs> he's got he's got those sort of lines, so uh, it was very good. So I mean that that was sort of for me, sort of like oh, my childhood come come true. But you can see all the technicians as well in the gallery even at least some big butch sort of technicians. Yeah, not true, yeah, no, yeah, no problem. Run of the mill, mate, run of the mill. Then you can see the moment top in the studio. So, it's top head, it's top head. You know, so that, it's really nice. Very, very nice indeed. And he got on very well with Kate as well. So, and it was a very nice bit uh, when he arrived. Um, this, this script coming in. Um, what would be really nice at the end of it is it to explain why I'm not in the story. Is if you do a Dick Mills gunshot and then a Keth McCullough sympathy, is it, I'll, I'll do the whole scene with my left profile to camera and then right at the end of the scene I'll turn. And I have a big bullet hole in my head, <laughs> blood and gore dripping down my face. And then just on my last line, good luck, my dears, I'll die. And John said, oh, oh come on, you know, we can't, we can't kill you off. So he settled for a bruise instead. Mom's bruise. So he does it off them that way. But, uh, this back. Lovely chap, really nice. And then pissed off his car at the end. Dad and I. Back a bit. How did you use Paul Bruce with the project actually come about? Um, I worked with, I was working, still working with John um, on a script about a serial killer called Killing Daddy, which hopefully may get done as out as a screen to or a script, whatever they're called. Um, and halfway through working on that, John was approached by Nick Hanbom, who's the editor of Children in Need. And he said, look, what to do a 30 years Doctor Who special, 10 minutes, uh, one episode, do, do, do you want to do it? So John said, fine, can you find a writer? Well, fine, no problem. So he asked me, um, I said, I'd do it. Well, I refused first of all, I said, I don't do it. Which, which ripped pieces by all the fans. Uh, if they don't like it, you know, but... So I did it, in the end agreed to do it. And then Noel's house party that the producer Michael Lego 
um, approached Children Need and said, well, it's a very exciting thing that you're doing. Can, can we have a, a second episode? So what they did originally was split the 10 minutes in half. So we had two five-minute episodes I, um, on Children Need and one following night on Noel's house party. And then children who decided that actually they wanted a longer episode so I think originally it went to seven minutes yeah seven minutes um, and then we filmed the first episode there's um there's, there's a 12 minute cut of the first episode um which then cut down again and that that now it turns was 7.50 so that's the one way we're using but there's quite a lot of nice stuff which is I think nice stuff, which is being cut out. But, so that's that's what it ended up as. It's supposed to be a five of the seven, or seven and five, that way round. Um, but it's back to the air on slightly longer. No, to Roman. We anticipate it. Do you give us any hints of what Noah's was doing in his cut out? There was a scene with, oh, let me get this right, scene with Peter and an assistant, I can't remember the assistant, was it Fraser? It might have been Fraser, I think, um, which was set in 2013. And there were two, there were two scenes set in 2013, one which has stayed in, which was with Colin and Caroline the Ford. And uh, no, that's the night of December 3. What am I talking about? No, with Pert and Liz Sladen, which is in 2013, which is the one we've used, which is in the original one with Peter and I think it was Fraser, um, we'd got all these futuristic cars, um, all the different bits and pieces that were supposed to signify in 2013, and we, we filmed that scene. And that was that was a clip because it actually it was it was a good scene, but it was sort of didn't really say anything that wasn't said in another scene, so that that was quite easy to get rid of, you know. And it, as with anything, you you always loathe to cut something that you you filmed. But we, we got rid of it. And the one, the one with Alex and Sladen that we've kept in is actually a very good, very good semester plot scene, um, which was very difficult for people to remember because it is so heavy because the, the program's so short. Um, all, all the dialogue is is cut down to a minimum, so uh, yeah, it, it's very difficult to sort out lots of uh, what's going on, Doctor. Well, I don't know, Sarah, but it's. Has to be what's going on, Doctor. Well, the round is trapped us in this time loop. It, it's very, very precise. And then we've got a futuristic tube train, which I think Mike Tucker, who is the Red Dwarf or special effects chap, um, nicked from Star Cops. Uh -huh. So we, we filmed, we locked up the shot on the bridge in Albert Square. Uh, um, with, you know, uh, the, the cafes on the other side of us the lawn drape before it and we locked, we locked off the shot and we had oh what's that Letitia Dean by Sharon dragged up to 20 years older and um, we had Spaden in his and this tube plane runs across the, the bridge in the back end but we were originally in that that one intending to put enormous skyscrapers futuristic skyscrapers in the back and have a thunderstorm and I mean all this sort of stuff that when you're writing in the script you think well oh, that would be a good idea Let, let's put us some nice sort of futuristic effects, but when it comes to it, the amount of time you put in the effects workshop, we actually can't do it. Um, because it just takes so long, it took us four hours to do the tube drain, which was three carriages. And when you think of four hours to do a very short effect, which is on screen for four seconds, you know, it just sort of makes you wonder how long it takes. You should realise how long it takes to do these things. That was one of the things we cut, anyway. Well, uh, on the uh, photographs that saw a Dalek, and so we could a bit of a control uh, whether it could be included or not. No, not at all. Not at all. We had um, a Dalek from BBC Enterprises shipped in, um, and we we ended up not using it for the simple fact, in the end, that it didn't cut together. Because the way that the 3D works, the camera has to be moving permanently. There are very, very few static shots, so most of the shots in it, when you watch, are all tracking shots or handheld camera shots. Um, and what happened was that there's a scene where the camera pans behind the, the stalls of the Queen Vic and Peter, 
Nicola Bryant and Sarah Smith <coughs> are running along Bridge Street and the Kahachi rotates around them. And as the car <coughs> rotates around them, we see the street which leads up to Pauline and Arthur's house and the butcher's house. And there was a, a vervoid, is it a vervoid? Big green fun thing and some other aliens standing up there. And then it, the camera keeps on panning round to Peter and the girls going into the garden in the centre. And then they did another shot, which was a tracking shot across the top of the garden, so they had a dark in the start of it. And you actually cut it together where the verboid and the other alien were standing. And you cut together the dark in it as well. The dark suddenly appears and the verboid has disappeared. So the, the reason we didn't use the dark was because it just didn't cut together. There was no continuity in the, the shot. So, no, no, I've tried to see, <coughs> but didn't help that one had been on GMTV doing aerobics the previous week or whenever it was, so just didn't cut together. So, it would look very silly having two aliens one moment, a dark and an X, where they're supposed to be appearing in no uh, work. In this break, I hear is it a moment. The makers have provided life size replicas of the wheel cart and the factory track. Yes, um, Sue, Sue, Sue Moore and Steve Mansfield. Um, because John had given them their, their first break in Doctor Who, uh, they provided two very, very good sculpted heads while Pablo and Trout are free of charge. Uh, I think Steve made them and Sue painted them, um, which we used for the opening sequence, the, the pre-title teaser, which is with the Rani and a character called Syrian, who is her henchman. And the, the only reason we had a henchman was simply because it's very difficult to get the plot across with just one nurse. <coughs> you've got to, you've got to, Syrian fulfilled the same function as any of the Doctor's companions, sort of to say, what's going on? what's happening, why we're here, so, and he was played by Sam West, who's two at the West and Vanilla Scales son, uh, who was actually a member of the Doctor Who Appreciation Society years and years ago, and it was a dream come true for him, him to do it, and he, he came on the set and said, you know, I'm so excited, I, I have two ambitions in my life, one is to play Hamlet and the other is to be in Doctor Who, uh, a bit bizarre. Um, so we use the two heads in that scene, and then in the, the Tom scene, which comes straight up to the opening titles, um, we have the heads, as I said, rotating out of the TARDIS into the time tunnel. And then in the second episode, we have the heads rotating out of the time tunnel into space. But what else can you So we suddenly said it was really bad taste to do the heads, but. I'm not, I'm not sure that was, you know, hey, I, it's just nice to have them in there. I, don't, I certainly don't think it's bad taste at all. I thought it was quite a, quite a nice little touch to have them in. Uh, it's a bit, because there, there was one, there was talk at one stage to have Dave, David Trout and his son, David Trout and Wade, Pat, um, but then that thought that was even more bad taste than using two heads, so we, we used the two heads of near, yeah, which, no, do look. I mean, they look. I say spitting image. Then they're, they're not caricatures. They're they're very very accurate duplicates of the heads, but look sort of slightly spitting image type texture to the to the skin. Very good, very good looks. We we did use those, but where might be an actual inspiration for the story? come from because it, it's uh, slightly unusual to have for dumped in the East Enders cross only but was there much sort of input from producers saying you I went, I went to an initial meeting with uh, Nick Haddle, John Nathan Turner um, and uh, Mark Thomas who's the head of Emily that entertainment to the BBC and they, they talking about the Doctor Who script and the, orig the original idea that I'd worked on was set in a sort of fuck palace and we, we were thinking about asking Michael Goff to come back and recreate a role that he'd done years and years ago uh, and then have each room in this sort of fun palace a different location and one of the locations that was suggested was Albert Square um, 
not by John, and not by me, it was by Adam. Um, and we thought, yeah, 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 we don't want to do that. And I, I had an immediate objection to it, and so I don't do anything in Albert Square at all. It's going to make it silly. Um, and they said, no, 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 think about it, think about it. And in the end, we worked out that idea wasn't actually a very good idea. It was sort of nice in, in theory. And anyway, in the end, they suggested, well, how about a day on the Albert Square lot? And you can do a day's worth of filming there. So it, it, it just developed. It was sort of never an idea that was rejected, but never an idea that I, I totally accepted. Uh, and then in the end, it was just suggested we do four days on Albert Square lot and film the whole thing, no studio, no, no other locations, the whole thing on Albert Square. Um, and then Albert, uh, the East Enders production team were filming two of the days, so we could only have it for two days. So they let us have it for two days. So we had to then relocate some the scenes. So we did all the Rani Stardis stuff in the studio in Norway, the Walden. And then we did quite a bit of stuff at Petasark, the Naval College in Greenwich, where we did all the helicopter stunts. And then we went to the Queen's House, which is opposite um, the Naval College. Uh, we did all the, the clip, well, I said the cliff at the end of episode two um, at the Queen's house. So it, it just sort of developed. It was never never forced on us, but it was actually quite a cheap way of, of shooting it because you have that for free for two days, which was quite nice. It was already a pre, pre-dressed, pre ready set for us to use. So it was quite a nice idea, but apart from that, it gets, it gets more viewers and four programmes working together is quite a quite a big part. We've seen children near up to EastEnders and Miles House Party, so that, that that's all, that's how that came about. But initially I was opposed to it. Didn't didn't like the idea, so I thought it'd be silly, but in the end it actually turned out as a, a very, very effective way to to link the story together because the time jumps that we actually the, the way the time jumps came about in the in the story was I was I was sitting on the bus one day, looking at the back of some old woman's blue rinsed hairdo, and thinking, God, what must she have looked like 20 years ago? And what should she look like 20 years in the future? I mean, it sounds banal, but that was literally how it, how it came about. So that's how we got the time jumps in. We got 1973, 1993, or 2013. So we thought it would be quite nice to make the East Enders characters up and down appropriately, so make Wendy Richards 20 years older and make her 20 years younger and that, that would sort of be a very very obvious visual sort of uh, visual clue to the Doctor what's going on and to the viewer as well that the fact that they're going through different time zones so that's how, how that all developed. Do you have any problem breaking a multi double judge come and do it? So yeah, it was a tribute to, tribute to Peter really and, and all the other Doctors as well and they sort of gave up a sort of days off to do, to come and do it and do it very well. You know, they, they, they all said it's like, it's like writing a mic doing Doctor Who. You know, you finish it sort of how many thousands of years ago we did it, and you come back, and you just slip straight back into it again. I mean, it's sort of when you forget your lies, you do you do lots of deep breathing, lots of panting, and sort of um, yes, um, yes, the Rani's doing this. And it's the same with the assistant, Louise Jameson, when she did it, she said it was like riding a bike as well. Said all you do is lots of pad tinkering. Very bizarre. You know, they, they all said the same thing. Very easy to get in. No. Oh, I can't, can't mention it. I can't print it and I should get lynched if I, if I do mention the... So, the sad actors, I won't, I won't tell you, the sad actors were swearing a lot. Uh, because they couldn't remember the lines and uh, throwing things around. It was, it's all part of the job. But you know, if you learn your lines sort of 10 minutes before and what you expect, and you know, because they were all busy, there's no chance for them to, to sit down and learn the lines. There's, what, there's one scene where Sylvester, <coughs> it's actually in the final version, uh, there's one scene where Sylvester forgets his lines, and thankfully the camera is panning around him doing a 360 degree turn. And when he forgets his lines, it's on his back. And whenever Sylvester forgets his lines, he always hyperventilates. Um, so in the original cut, there was this scene where Sylvester said, oh, the Rani's trying to transfer a massive... 
time to alter the Greenwich Meridian. And he, he did that, and you know, it was the best take because, you know, everybody else remembered the lines and the camera work was very, very good. Um, so all we did was we wiped the soundtrack of that, and because it was his back to the camera, we took the line from previous scene and overlaid it. So what you, what you get <coughs> in the final version is the camera going round back of Sylvester, a big pause, and then I was transferring massive time tunnel to the Greenwich Meridian, and then back to his face, and then we get back to the back to the same scene. But I mean, it's very difficult. I mean, there were so many people around. We had a crew of about 50, and then plus all the extras. Um, you know, and Sylvester was having to dash off to do the Invisible Man. You know, he'd got a lot of things on his mind, so it gets understandable, you know, but all credit in that he remembered such a, an enormous scene that he's got, because he does a three end scene. Uh, <coughs> well, I mean, it's very easy to forget your lines. I've done it many a time, ever so. Good on Sylvester. <laughs> covering it up with this hyperventilator, but that's, you know, like riding a bike, you just pant a lot. So, if there's ever any panting in a Doctor Who story, it's because they've forgotten the lines. Just, just remember the back. Yeah. And, uh, there are two possible endings, are there? No. That, you've been reading DWB. No, it's supposed to be a phone uh, two, <coughs> two possible starts. Oh, two, two possible starts. starts. What it is, at the end of the first episode, we have the cliffhanger. And it's the rather menacing the doctor or whatever it, whatever it is. Um, and then at the end of that, you have to phone up and pledge money whether you want Mandy to rescue the doctor or Big Ron. <laughs> uh, and then whoever wins, the following night, that particular episode is shown. And all it literally is, I mean, it's a two second, three second shot um, which is dropped in. Which is, what I won't tell you what they do, but it, I mean, it's certainly not funny by any stretch of the imagination, but it's, you know, literally it's just that short a difference. So if, you, if it's the manly version that's transmitted, don't feel cheated because you haven't seen the big wrong version <laughs> at all, because it's the big wrong version. It's exactly the same, the same lines. You know, it's a bit of a, bit of a con, but, you know, it's literally, like I said, three seconds, so don't worry. But that, that's what it is. And somebody was saying that we filmed two different endings to the story. One, was it one with K9 going in the TARDIS, one with K9 sitting outside the TARDIS, Bandle 10, saying goodbye, Doctor, or whatever. I mean, box. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't at all. Well, K9 didn't even work. We had to pull him along on a fish wire. <laughs> And all, all credit to Matt Irving, because he brought K9 o'clock in the morning when we were filming on the, on the Friday to the Cutty Sark. And I, actually, he got K9 <coughs> working then on the remote control thing um, and was sitting behind his car, just letting it run around on the, the cobbles. And, and this party of school children came past. It, it was actually, this is the one thing that I will remember because it was such a magical moment that these, this group of kids, eight, nine, ten, all stopped and looked at K9, didn't notice Matt sitting behind the car, and thought it was this real live computer dog. And they all knew who he was. I mean, for kids of that age, to know who K9 was, it's, you know, I think quite a tribute to that character's longevity. You know, or whether they've seen repeats or video tapes or not, I don't, I don't know. But they were all mesmerised by this little dog running around, flashing its eyes and wagging its, waggling its ears. And then when we got it to the Queen's house in the afternoon, the bastard thing broke down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had, when we didn't need it, it worked. <coughs> and when we needed it, we had to pull it on off fish wire. <laughs> so, but his ears worked in the afternoon, so, so that was, that was something. Uh, but it uh, didn't run very well. But we didn't film two endings for, for that at all. Perish the thought. We had enough time getting the, you know, the ending finished. One version of the ending. You know, before Sylvester had to had to race oh, off. So you know, two endings would have been silly to do. Or support you voting twice. You know, so we'd already got the multiple choice beginning. So. That's where that came from. I assume it was a mix up between the, the two. Right, so I'm just staring. Well, that will be up to your questions from the floor now. If anyone's got any questions, go. Yeah, go away, please, God.
Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Remember they talked? Yes, well, it's not a new title sequence, it's the old um, Sylvester title sequence, the, the, the computer graphics one. But what, what we've actually done, because the story's so short, we sped up the title sequence to, to double speed. Um, and it looks very good. And we've actually flipped the whole thing. Um, so the explosion comes in on the right, doesn't it? And then curves across the front of the screen and then goes into a rotating ball or something. Well, this one, we've got the explosion on the left. And we've just flipped the entire thing. Um, and like I said, sped it up, and it very good. And we, we 3D'd it. We put a, a left-moving star field behind it, um, simply because of the 3D. The 3D, I don't understand how it works at all, but it's it's something to do with. And without without the glasses, it's a normal TV picture completely. You can, you can watch it with or without the glasses, and it looks wonderful. Um, but the, the camera has to be moving. 99% of the time to get the effect and what it is if the camera moves left whatever's in the scene has to move right and if the camera moves right has to move it's very good I don't understand it and um, it's this German technique very clever um, and you have to have foreground interest middle ground interest and background interest so you've got the three layers and what it is it's those three layers interacting that creates the 3d the specs all they do is the one lens is slightly darker and delays the image from the TV screen going to your brain by a frame. And as a result, you, the whole picture, rather than seeing it like that, you see it like that. And that, that's what creates the 3D. Um, the, the left moving star field behind the title sequence helps because you've got the title sequence doing that. So you've got that, it's the wrong way around, isn't it? You've got that action. So that's what creates the, the 3D. And we've got a new theme, which is very good. It's a rave from Persian for Dr. O. <laughs> which you may laugh, it's very good. It was um, written by a group called Cybertech, who are a bunch of uh, Doctor Who fans, who, when we, when we were doing <coughs> the, the location shoot in Albert Square, um, they pressed you know, this cassette tape, this C90 to John's hand, and said, have a listen, have a listen. John didn't know what it was. Um, and on the way back home afterwards, put it on the machine in the car. I mean, all these versions of the Doctor Who theme, one of them in particular, extremely good. Um, and it's this very, very upbeat, thumping, heavy bass version of the theme. Um, I, I say rave, I mean, it's, it's not really rave, but, you know, it's sort of got that, that edge to it, that feel to it. Um, and it's, there's only 20 seconds worth of time loss. Um, but we asked the, the Pet Shop Boys originally to do the V. Um, and at the time, we asked them, they were extremely busy, and said no, but we will, we will in November, do a live performance on Children in Need. So, okay, thanks. That's very kind of you. Then we asked Erasure to do a version of it, a serious version of it. Um, and we never, we never got a response from Erasure. So when we got this new version of the theme on from this fan, we thought, oh, well, we'll, we'll use this because it's extremely good. And then literally two days after we dubbed this version of the theme onto the opening titles, Erasure got back and said, we'd love to do it. We'd love to do it. So we were a bit cross about that, but you know, once you use somebody's, you know, somebody's version, you can't say, sorry, we've got somebody better. You know, and I, I don't honestly know whether it would have been any better, but it would have been a nice publicity gimmick to, to have a race, to admit, but not. Which is a bit of a shame. But the, the new, new titles look, I think, very good. Very good. And if you look closely, you can just see Sylvester's face. Because what we do is, as the TARDIS is rotating back, we cut straight out of that to the burst of stars, and then the whom rolling forward and it's just at that point where that cut if you look very close to a freeze frame if you're that bothered just see the faint outline of Sylvester's so some cut two up there it, it looks very good very good and the end title is just like four seconds so it's just that you're rolling forward so to be continued or the end of it. 
So that's what we've done with the titles. You want to ask a question, don't you? No. I haven't thought that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Any, any... No, don't be silly. I hate the programme. I loathe it. I really do. We were lucky to get... We were lucky to get this together. It's only because it was Chuck didn't need to want it. Um, and not the BBC. It's, the programme has become too much trouble for the BBC, simply because if a story doesn't... This is, this is going to sound rude, and I'm not meaning it to sound rude. If, if for example, there's a continuity error in the story, they get a thousand letters saying, this never happened in Evil of the Daleks, or whatever. And they'll be, oh... <laughs> and it's that sort of reaction, so they, they don't want that trouble. Literally, the BBC couldn't care less at all. Um, and, you know, if people hate this story, which I'm sure a lot of people will, you know, why I don't know, because it's really good. Um, <laughs> if, if people hate this and write in the BBC, oh, more, more letters from... And it, it's, you know, it's just one of those sad things. The people who like it most are the people who are least listened to by the BBC, which is, you know, indicative of the state the BBC is in that, you know, not a pleasant place to work. There are so many people who are watching their backs. Uh, but, uh, but we'll see. Whether Spielberg applies to them, I don't know. I hope he does. Whether it, but it makes it any better or not, I don't know. Whether, whether the Americanisation of it. Does it?